Good afternoon, I'm Abe. And I'm Frank. And today, we're adumbrating the second half of Chapter 5, Colonial Society on the Eve of Revolution. I'll take it away this time. So we start off with the Great Awakening. So American colonials were getting tired of boring Latin sermons from their preachers. Yeah, Latin is very boring, and the Americans wanted something new. So here comes in Armenianism. And Armenianism promises that all humans can go to heaven. This is contrary to the accepted view of Calvinist doctrine, which had predestination saying that some were already determined for heaven and some for hell. But this new theology comes in and it says that if you do good works, you can go to heaven. So that saves off the great revival for a little bit. But people are still, they want something new. They want something greater than what they had before. So as religion, religious passion began to decline and new liberal ideas began to water down this old time religion, America's first big religionist movement started. And this is known as the Great Awakening. And it tried to bring people back to the fundamental Christianity and try to save their souls from the fires of hell. One of the leading preachers here is Jonathan Edwards. He was one of the leaders at this time. And he said that salvation comes not through good works, but through God's grace alone. So move back to what Calvin thought versus Arminianism, which stated that good works could lead you to heaven. He painted vivid pictures of hell. In his most famous sermon, uh, sermon Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, he preached that hell was, quote, paved with the skulls of unbaptized children. So pretty intense stuff. George Whitefield was another great preacher during the Awakening. Whitefield was an amazing speaker. This guy brought people to tears, cheers, and convulsions simply through talking. His style of preaching was to strike the emotions, to hit them in the heart rather than in the head, so to speak. His goal was to strike at sinners and have them repent or ask for forgiveness and turn to their faith to Christ. These preachers were called new lights. They were those who used lots of drama and dramatic style during their preaches and presentations. And they're in contrast to old lights, such as an Anglicans and traditional Congressionalists and Presbyterians. These traditionals, these old lights, didn't like the drama and the style. The results of the Great Awakening were first, that the Baptist faith grew in numbers, however, as they embraced the new light system of preaching. That new light universities sprang up, such as Princeton, Brown, Rutgers, and Dartmouth, and that the Great Awakening was America's first mass movement. The entire culture as a people moved forward with this religious movement. So, Abe, tell me. I talked a little bit about Dartmouth and Princeton, but how was schooling in those days? Okay, so um, New England, the New England colonies, placed the most value on education. The New England colonies were the most religious, and the colleges tra trained the clergymen, so this was obvious. Um, in the other colonies, time was spent farming and working and not wasted on schooling. Um, but still, there were many fairly good elementary and secondary schools in all of the colonies, but the schools were mo mainly for the rich and mostly for boys. The topics of study in these schools included mainly the classics, such as Greek and Latin, always great subjects, and religion, okay? Uh, the mood at the school was very serious and somber, and often dis discipline was fast and harsh. Often, the rod was not spared. Second, uh, the focus overall on schools wasn't on experiment and reason as it often is today, but instead on, on dogma and doctrine, okay? So there wasn't freedom of expression or mind. The influence of the church on schools was very considerable, but it was, it was slowly waning. In New England, the top priority of colleges was still to train men for the ministry, as we saw with the College of William and Mary. Um, but by 1750, there was a movement from the dead to the live languages, unfortunately. Um, Benjamin Franklin, our friend right here, um, helped start the University of Pennsylvania, which was the first non-denominational university, basically. It focused on more worldly and relevant matters. So Frank, other than religion, could you tell me about colonial culture? Absolutely. Colonial culture was pretty drab and barren. Work and worry left little time for recreation. What little time was left over was spent on religion, especially in Puritan states. Remember that time isn't being wasted on arts and literature in the 13 colonies at this point. However, painting and art was looked upon as a waste of time in general. But there are a few notable exceptions. Look at John Trumbull, who was discouraged in painting by his father, but still went into Europe to be trained in art. 
There's also Charles Wilson Peale, who became best known for portraits of George Washington. Those are two examples of early American painters, but some moved to Europe, like Benjamin West and John Copley. So there we see four clear examples of how American art began to grow despite the fact that most time was being spent towards religious purposes. Architecture in America was also transported over from Europe and focused on the practical rather than the stylish. The log cabin, which was brought over by Sweden, which we learned about earlier, was one of the main features of the colonial landscape, and eventually superseded by the Georgian style, which began appearing around 1720 and became popular in towns with its red brick, solid and well insulated against the cold colonial winters. Colonial literature was sparse. Americans wasted little time in writing and focused mostly on working and praying. A couple of notable exceptions include Phyllis Wheatley, whose poetry was notable. She was a slave girl with no formal education. Ooh. However, she eventually got a whole book of poetry published, despite her considerable past. Benjamin Franklin is another notable exception to this rule. In his Poor Richard Almanac, which was immensely popular, he read, uh, it, was read more than any, it was read more than anything else except for the Bible. Franklin's exploits with experiments, like the flying kite, proved that even America, with its colonial background and very harsh Puritan rules, could advance the sciences. So, Abe, we know that the colonists didn't spend that much time on art or architecture, mm -hmm. but what about reading and writing? Yeah, so reading also wasn't too common in colonial America. Books were too expensive, and therefore libraries were scarce, although some notable families, such as the Bird family, did have their own private libraries. Pamphlets were more common than books. As the Revolutionary War drew near, printers hand-cranked out their pamphlets. They hand-wrote them and copied them. They were po these were popular ways to keep on top of the current events at the time. John Peter Zenger was a printer in New York, and he, he printed some unflattering things about the governor of New York, and therefore Zenger was ad uh, arrested for seditious libel. But his lawyer, Andrew Hamilton, argued that what he printed was true, what Zenger printed was true, and therefore was not libel. Zenger won the case because the jury decided to side against him and against the law, but, and, but more importantly, it was a landmark case for the freedom of the press. Thereafter, true statements about public officials could not be prosecuted as so libel. Frank, with this increased freedom of the press, how did politics evolve and change in the colonies? Yeah, so politics began to really take their shape in the 13 colonies. So we see by 1775, eight colonies had royal governors who'd been appointed by the king. So that's pretty illiberal. But three colonies had governors selected by the proprietors, so the people within that colony. Nearly each colony had a two-house legislature, so the upper house was chosen by either royal officials in the royal colonies or by the colony's proprietor, as in the proprietary colonies. So the lower house was filled uh, by the election by the people. So that's the most liberal right there, because that's where people are directly voting for their representatives in the house. And that's what we see today in our congressional system. So most governors were effective, but uh, there were a few notable exceptions. The main one is Lord Canterbury, appointed by, uh, king, uh, by the King of England. He was uh, named New York and New Jersey governor, and he turned out to be, he was an embezzler and a drunkard, and he was thrown out eventually. But for the most part, the governors weren't corrupt in the colonies because the colonists had the power of the purse over the governor. They could actually withhold the governor's salary if the governor didn't perform up to par. So here we see also that the right to vote is expanding in the colonies. It's getting more and more liberal. So they're still, uh, limiting, they're still limiting it to white males only, but the land requirement that we saw in previous chapters is starting to disappear. So more people are able to vote. So by 1775, America is not a total democracy by any calibration, but it's far more liberal than its European cousins. So Abe, we saw that politics were starting to take on a more liberal tone. How did this manifest itself in the life of the average colonist? All right, so um, life for the uh, average American was drab and tedious with a lot of, with very few comforts. Churches had no heat, they were often very cold. Houses didn't have running water or, or indoor plumbing, and there were no garbage disposal systems. Still, Americans were not without amusements. Work and play mixed during uh, the house and, and the barn raisings, and there, were, there was lots of quilting bee competitions, husking bee competitions. 
flaxing bee competitions, and so on. Southerner, Southerners, though, on the other hand, enjoyed plays, card playing, horse racing, uh, and cockfighting and other amusements. Lotteries were strangely accepted, even by the clergy, because they were used to raise money for the church. Holidays were also celebrated across, across the colonies. Christmas was uh, not New Englanders frowned upon Christmas because it aligned too closely with the Pope, but Thanksgiving was very popular because it combined praise and love and thanks for God with jollity and feasting. Now, overall, there were many similarities with Britain's North American colonies. All used the English language and customs. That's one. Two, all of them were mostly Protestant. Three, there was lots of opportunity for social mobility. And four, there was some measure of self-government active in all, in all of them, but no complete democracy yet. Thank you for watching. Please comment, like, and subscribe, and we'll catch you guys next time.